The time to crown state champions is almost here. We've got a look at the soccer, tennis, and baseball teams still left after another week of playoff action. Plus, the Braves lead the NL East after a month for the first time in four years. We take a closer look at how the young guns on the team are helping Atlanta defy expectations. The last call starts right now. Welcome back to The Last Call. I'm your host, Justin Holbrock. Less than a month is here until school is out for high school students, which means playoffs for spring sports are also winding down. We've got soccer, tennis, and of course baseball to catch up on, so let's start in the diamond. Fifteen teams were still alive before this week, some advanced, and some won't be back until next season. Let's run it back. Let's start with Smith Station. The Panthers fell 3-2 in Game 1, but came back to win Game 2, 10-4. Second inning, Ryan Middleton gets the start. Bases low, the ball hits off his glove. Smith Station gets a lucky bounce, and they turn the double play to get out of the inning. Bottom of the second now, runners on third and second after a wild pitch. Another wild throw allows Ryan Bradley to score, gets in under the tag. 1-0 Smith Station. Next batter, it's another unearned run. Pass ball brings home Sterling Evilsizer. The Panthers go up 2-0. Bottom of the fifth, same score. Runner on third, Owen Clark makes a great stop but Dalton Harrelson beats the throw. RBI single for him. They go up 3-0. Another insurance run in the sixth. Carson Swilling chops it between third and short. Ryan Bradley scores the second time that day. The Panthers get a sack fly, and they lead 5-0. And how about the day from freshman Trent Hodgson? He didn't start, but he came out of the bullpen in the third inning, got the Panthers out of a bases loaded jam, then pitched four more scoreless innings, and Smith Station is heading to the semifinals, where they're going to play the Auburn Tigers. I was nervous, and um, when I was in the bullpen, I was just like, do what you always do, and it'll work. Start settling after my, when I got that first out, and then after that, from there, I was pretty dominant. Yeah, you know, this this time of year in a game three, uh, we had only had a two-run lead, so so we couldn't afford to give up many runs. He responded well to the pressure, considering, and, and threw strikes, and that's what we needed, and, and did a good job. First game is Friday at 7 Eastern in Auburn. All right, over to Callaway. They were playing Raven County this week, and the Cavs took game one three to nothing. Let's go to the top of the second. No score. The pitcher, Wesley Marchman, doing himself a favor and putting runs on the board. Single gets through, and that brings home Braylon Mitchell to score, and they go up one to nothing. Same inning. Runners on third and second. Brooks Bledsoe puts it in almost the exact same spot. Two more runners come in to score. Callaway now up three zip. Next inning, it's Bledsoe again coming up big for the Cavaliers. He's going to score two more. Callaway would go up 5-1. to one. The Wildcats would end up tying it 7-7. Seven to seven. And in the top of the seventh, Braylon Mitchell launched a two-run home run to give Callaway the lead and eventually the 9-7 to seven win as they advance to the quarterfinals. Next game, we've got the Glenwood Gators, the defending state champions from the 3A and AISA, hosting Monroe in the state semis. A rough first inning start for Glenwood. Logan Caldwell drives in Griffin McKenzie, and it's 1-0 Monroe Academy. Then it's Bryce Black. He's going to drive in two more runs. Noah Goodman and Logan Caldwell come in to score, and it's 3-0. Uh, after that, we're going to have to look out for our own equipment. It's expensive back there, and the ball is going to shoot right back at us. Glenwood hoping to advance to the state final where they're used to being. Slade James gets a hold of one, but not quite far enough. Glenwood turns it around, though. They win 8-6 to six, and then 7-3 to three to advance to the championship. Also in the AISA, Chambers Academy is heading to the 1A state title. Let's look at some more scores from road games this week. Columbus takes down Burke County 9-3 in Game 1, and then 8-1 in Game 2 to advance. And then Calvary Christian also advanced this week. They won 16 to 5 yesterday in their semifinal game to advance to the GICAA championship. Other Georgia teams, not so great this week. Hardaway, Troop County, Harris County, Brookstone, and Jordan were all eliminated, and so was Russell County. All right, soccer playoffs continuing this week. It's round two for our Georgia schools, but opening week for most of our Alabama schools. We had 20 teams left before the playoffs began this week, and now it's down to one. Out of the 20 teams who played, five made it to the quarterfinals. Here's those scores. Columbus girls lose 4-0 in the quarterfinals. Pacelli boys also lose 3-1. The Northside girls also fall 3-0. And the Auburn boys, the only team to advance, they beat Foley 1-0. Smith Station boys also eliminated. They lost 3-1. Over to tennis, where a trip to the state championship 
was at stake for the girls' teams at both Columbus and Brookstone on Thursday. Both teams put on a dominating performance. Lady Cougars swept Stratford Academy. They are now playing for a third straight state title. The Columbus girls won state two years ago and have a chance to do it again after beating West Lawrence with a strong outing from Mary West in Corville, who won her match 6-1 to one in less than an hour. And in college, the CSU men and women are heading back to the Sweet 16 for the second year in a row. The women will play May 8th and the men the next day, both playing in Surprise, Arizona. All right, Columbus Lions traveled to Massachusetts for their first road game of the year, chippy early on. Columbus up right now, and it's a one-handed touchdown from Tristan Purifoy. The Lions led 23-15 to at half. They led by 15 in the second half, but the Pirates came all the way back. They were up by seven. Then the Lions tie it. Mason Espinoza hits Jarmon Fortson for the touchdown. And then less than 10 seconds left. Sean Bratton to LaVon Pearson. Yes, .01 second left, and it's basically a walk-off win. And the Lions lose their first game of the year, 44-37. to Over at Carver High School, a pair of girls' basketball signings this week. Alicia Reese is heading to CVCC to play for the Pirates. And her Tigers teammate, Mariah Igus, is heading to Florida to play for St. Petersburg College. Both were thanking their head coach. Well, with Coach Huntley, I learned how to work hard and push myself. Because without him, I wouldn't be here. Um, just hard work and putting the work in to be good people and things. But in order for me to win what I want to, I got to work much harder and things. Congrats to both of them. All right, still to come on the last call. First place belongs to the Braves for the first time in four years. Sports director Brendan Robertson will show you how the youngsters in Atlanta have helped propel the team to that top spot. And $150 million is now the going rate for a franchise quarterback. This week, Matt Ryan signed a five-year extension. I'll have more details on Ryan, the highest paid player in the NFL. Atlanta has the three youngest players in Major League Baseball. You might call them the Baby Braves, but their impact this season has been all grown up. It started last year when we got the arrival right of that young man, Ozzy Albies. And this year he has continued to shine both in the batter's box and in the field, having an all-star caliber type season at second base. And then we met the 20-year-old Ronald Acuna Jr. See, Albies is 21 now. He's the elder statesman. Acuna announced his arrival in the series against the Cincinnati Reds with that towering shot. Also drove in the game-winning run, which was Freddie Freeman. Now the veteran Freeman, happy to sit back and let the baby Braves take the spotlight. Uh, those are the games you got to win, though. Uh, you know, that was a pretty fantastic game, I think, all the way around. Yeah. Mike pitched great. Bullpen came in. We got a lot of hits, not a lot of runs, but we got enough. You know, I'm okay <laughs> with staying out of the limelight. Uh, we got a lot of exciting young guys, and we had another guy come in in Soroka and step up tonight and big win in front of a lot of people. So, Soroka, who's this guy? Well, that's 20 year old Mike Soroka. He is the Braves' 2015 first round pick. And he got a little run support in his first start, which was only in New York against first place Mets against former Cy Young winner Noah Syndergaard. And after Freeman provided some run support, we got a look at Sororka. Got out of a jam in the first, got the out there, then with two runners on. Mom and Dad so proud, Canadian flag. He was in high school two years ago in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Dol Juno. Got out of the jam there. And take a look at the. Uh, Movement here on the curveball from Sororka. He's got the gas too, can dial it up to about 95 miles an hour. Here's Brian Snichter back in spring training on Sororka. Sororka will take the first. I mean, this kid, uh, you know, it, it's if we didn't send him out, I'd have probably hidden him somewhere to, uh, <laughs> to have him with us. Very, he's a very impressive young man. I mean, he's way beyond his years maturity wise. You know, and looking at him and watching pitch and talking to some guys, it, it might have even played up a little bit off last year. Um, but he's got a lot of confidence, knows what he's doing, is going to be a young big leader. And he certainly was. And then the rest of the Braves staff starting to come through. Sean Newcomb had a great night in New York as well as the Braves on Wednesday night took over first place in the National League East. Freddie Freeman 
got the hitting started. And while other people may be surprised to see the Braves in first, nobody in the clubhouse is. I don't want to say we expected it, but we didn't. We, we expect to play well, and we've been playing well uh, pretty much all season. So, um, you know, we're going to continue to go out there and play the game the right way. And we've been grinding at bats, having professional bats all the way through. And, um, you know, us winning games is not a surprise to anybody in this clubhouse. So, the baby Braves, first place Braves, maybe World Series champion Braves. Long way to go, but we will see. And this young group certainly paving the way for much more success. All right, thank you, Brendan. To end that series with the Mets, Ronald Acuna blasted a 425-foot home run, and Ozzie Albies smashed his 10th homer of the season. Oh, and don't forget, Julio Tehran flirted with a no-hitter until two outs in the seventh inning. Back at home, things did not go so well against the Giants. In Game 1 on Friday, San Francisco won 9-4, followed by an 11-2 pounding yesterday. San Fran tattooed Brandon McCarthy for eight runs in just over three innings, and 11 runs is the most Atlanta has given up in one game this season. And finally, today, their ninth inning comeback fell just short, so the Braves sweep and get swept this week. In football, the Atlanta Falcons now have the NFL's highest paid player. This week, the team agreed to a five-year, $150 million contract with quarterback Matt Ryan with $100 million guaranteed. The new deal runs through the 2020-2023 season and will make Ryan the first player to average at least $30 million a year. Ryan was the league's MVP in 2016 and led the team to a Super Bowl, which they of course lost. Since Ryan entered the league in 2008, only the Patriots, Packers, and Steelers have more wins than the Falcons. We're still serving on the last call. Coming up, we sit down with Chad Dixon from the Citizen of East Alabama to talk about Smith Station against Auburn in the semifinals. All right, welcome back to our expert of the week. Today I'm joined by Chad Dixon. He's from the Citizen of East Alabama. He's a sports reporter. And Chad, we're talking everything Smith Station baseball. They're heading to the Final Four where they're going to face Auburn. So take me through why this team might be able to win the title this year. I think it's they've got a great amount of pitching, just like in 2015 where that group was headed up by Max Newton, who went to Troy, Blake Rivera, who was drafted last year, um, and he's going to Auburn. Um, I'll go back to 15, and, and the teams kind of mirror each other. The pitching at the top is really good. The hitting isn't necessarily sc scoring 10, 15 runs a game, but they're doing just enough. And, yeah, I think it should be a great series. Pitching will be a premium. I am interested to see if Auburn holds out their ace, Brooks Fuller, again for game two like they did in the area series. So let's talk about that area series a little bit more. What can they learn from that series and take that they can apply to the semifinal and use to advance to the final? Um, I think the hitters uh, learned a little something about themselves. Runners in scoring position is going to be a premium. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's going to be a ton of traffic. I think that it's basically who's going to get the key hit when they get the key hit. I think both sides, pitching-wise, are going to be on the money. Um, but as far as Smith Station goes, I think you know they're led by Justin Owens at the top, Dalton Harrelson. He had uh, two hits in game one right. against Auburn. So I think if those two guys click and the rest of the lineup will soon follow. But at the same time, Auburn has been ranked number one number one team in the state of Alabama for a reason, hmm. and they won the area for a reason. Uh, I think Smith Station has a good chance, if you want to call it an upset, to pull the upset. And, and the reason I say it is this, because since they won the title in 2015, there is a expectation in that program to defend the legacy that was started. Because this program, this baseball program, felt like they should have more state titles. Hmm. Now shifting gears, let's talk about Russell County. Their season came to an end. They had a great year. Kind of evaluate their year, and also what do they have to look forward to next season? They went. Uh, they lost their first game of the season. I believe it was to Oxford. I believe um, they rattled off, I believe, thirty something wins in a row, mm -hmm. and they did it with a, a young core, a sophomore core. They have four seniors. Granted, one of the, one of the seniors, their ace Hunter Milam, or going into the season was their ace. And but if you look at the statistics, Kobe Van Bogart, Logan Austin, you could pick it apart and say they had better hmm. overall seasons than Hunter, even though he was the ace, you know, going into it. And pretty much the entire offense is coming back. Uh, I believe they had 12 uh, sophomores this year, one junior. Wow. And, one, and one of the guys um, – you're looking at is there is, is Hunter Donaldson right. hitting over 400 led um, I think he led all sophomores in RBIs last year probably did that again this year I mean he's having a great year Zane Falk's having a great year another sophomore so they're loaded I, 
and they'll get realigned next year. Yeah. I believe they're getting aligned with Opelika and Benjamin Russell. So those games should be fun to see. A lot less trips to Dothan. Yes, that's for sure. It's a young team, a lot to look forward to. Chad, thanks so much for joining Thank you, us. Sir. Appreciate it. All right. Welcome back to Picks of the Week. I'm joined by Jack Patterson. He's with me again this week. Looks like we can't get enough of each other. I'm going to go with the Georgia Bulldogs. They're a top 10 team in the country. They've looked great so far yeah. this year. No, I'm going to go with you on Georgia. They've looked like one of the best teams in the entire country. They're a top five team, so I like Georgia in that as well. All right, so for baseball picks, six count. Who are you going with this week? Probably shouldn't do this after this weekend, but I'm going with the Braves. <laughs> they got swept by the Giants, but... They have a two-game set yeah. against Tampa Bay and then a four-game set against Miami. Those are two beatable teams. All right, for me, I'm taking the Indians. Kind of a weird schedule. they got two games against the Brewers, and, and they've got three against the Royals. Field. And then the following week, I'm going to take them in two games against Detroit, so we'll see how the Tribe end up doing. And for our personal pick, I'm going to start. I'm taking UFC 224. Of course. I'm going to go with Amanda Nunes over Raquel Pennington in the main fight of that night. All right. I'm going to go back to the pitch. Atlanta United, the number one team in the Eastern Conference. So you're wondering, why am I going to pick them? But they playing two games in four days this week. Okay. One game against Sporting Kansas City on Wednesday, and then another one against Orlando City, their rivals. That's two tough teams. So they're going to win one of those games. I couldn't tell you which one, but they're going to win one. All right, good deal. So I'm going to tell you Brendan's picks. He's taken Winnipeg, sorry, Jack, to beat Nashville if there is a game seven, right? For baseball, he's going to go with the Nationals. And for his personal pick, or excuse me, for his SEC pick, he's taking Florida. All right, so Connor, he is taking Alabama softball to win the SEC championship. He is taking the Red Sox, which is a pretty good pick for baseball. Sure. And then for some strange reason, I don't know why, because none of them will work yet, he's taking Kyle Bush to win at Kansas. Sure. And look out, man. I'm only, look at one, Jay moving up. I'm only <laughs> one game behind you, man. I'm not we're scared. going to have a new first place team next week, and it's going to be me. I'm not scared. You should. All right, that's it for Picks of the Week. Coming up, we take you inside the Jordan track and field team for both the boys and girls as our latest Athletes of the Week. The Jordan High track and field teams are gearing up to head to the state tournament. Carlos Williams caught up with the Jackets to see how they're preparing and present them with our Athletes of the Week award. Well, the Jordan High Red Jackets track and field teams have enjoyed overwhelming recent success and have become one of the top teams in the area. This season, team members under the guidance of head coach Russell Scott came in second in Region 5 AA competition. They also did well at sectionals and are practicing extremely hard as they get set to head to state. They know what it will take to win. And these are my teammates, Wyatt, Caleb, and E-Man. And for us to make it, it's going to take for everybody to work as a team and to work with 110%. We have done so good throughout the whole season. We just got to keep working hard and pushing ourselves to do better to make it to where we're trying to get. And Coach Scott hopes his team can continue to do well, but knows it won't be easy. It, it was a struggle from the beginning. Uh, we had a lot of kids that had some internal things that were going on that we worked out and they worked through and, and collectively they came together as a team and did what they needed to do to, to accomplish their goal to move to the next level. Now when they get to state, the Red Jacket runners will compete in about nine events with an obvious goal to win as many of those events as possible. Um, I had a lot of kids that have been to the state before they had success early as freshmen and sophomores. We got one or two guys that are ranked number two uh, in the state in the high jump. Um, and and they're, they're, they're looking pretty good overall. So I got my fingers crossed. And as they get set to take it to the next level, we say good luck. And congratulations to the Jordan High Red Jackets track and field teams, our Cody Road Trophies and Jewelers, Athletes of the Week. At the track at Connect Stadium, I'm Carlos Williams for News 3 Sports. On your side. Best of luck to them. Softball games are coming to a close in the SEC and less than three weeks to go for baseball. Let's start in the Plains. Auburn with a sub-500 conference record before their series of number 21 Vanderbilt. On Friday, Casey Mize, the number one pitching prospect in the country, struck out 15 batters, tying an Auburn record. The Tigers, they won big on Saturday, scoring 11 runs. Then they scored 14 today, sweeping Vandy for the first time in 16 years. And speaking of a sweeping, the number 20 Georgia Bulldogs brushed off Missouri. Adam Sasser crushed four home runs in softball. The Tigers closed out the season with two non-conference wins, and three spots behind them is Alabama, which got a much-needed sweep over number nine Texas A&M on a walk-off of all things. And to round it out, Georgia, a top-five team, lost its first conference series of the year 
to end their regular season. Coming up, Auburn grad Jason Dufner made his way back to the Plains this week for a great cause. We'll have more on that in just a bit. On Monday, Auburn grad Jason Duffner held his annual Celebrity Golf Classic. The Jason Duffner Foundation focuses on ending childhood hunger in Lee County, providing meals for more than 1,000 children throughout the school year as well as the summer. Some big names out in Auburn included Jordan Spieth, Alabama grad Justin Thomas, basketball coach Bruce Pearl, and former NFL linebacker Takeo Spikes, all happy to be part of something that benefits kids all across Lee County. What a great cause. All right, thanks so much for watching The Last Call. We're on every Sunday night at 1130. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook at WRBL Sports. Have a great night.